thing. I sure had a good time coming up with it. <laughs> the Lord is good. And I welcome all of you for being here. I enjoyed the first service very much. And so we have doing a series. My wife's doing a series on if animals could talk. And so I'm going to give you a couple of animals today to see what they might be talking about. Can I get an amen? So we're going to find out what the ox and the ass have to say to each other in the book. Can I get an amen? All right. Well, I welcome you so much, and I'm excited about being here. I'd like to just start out in the book of James in the third chapter. And Deb, if you could pop that up for me, please, I sure would appreciate it. Now look at this. Now out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. Brother, these things ought not to be so. Can I get an amen on that one? Blessings and cursings should not be coming out of the very same old mouth. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Everybody said, mm-mm. So in our life, we've got to understand that in the garden, there's a sweet tree and there's a bitter tree. One's called the tree of life and the other's called the tree of Knowledge, knowing good, not or, and evil. So those trees, those trees are words. Are you listening to me? The tree of life is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The tree of life in the garden is the Word of God. It's God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is carnality. He said, if you eat of this tree... Carnal, you'll die. But if you eat of this tree, life, you'll live and not die. And so, when man got down to the garden, which God had given him to take care of and to prune, and he told him to prune that tree so he could touch it, even though Satan said you can't touch it. Yes, you could touch it, but your job was to prune it and to take care of it and to make sure that that particular tree was not to end Influence your life. Only the tree of life. And then when Eve bowed her knee to the voice of the enemy, which had taken on the form at that time of a serpent, which is a sign of sin or deception. And then when he takes on this form, and in that day, can't tell you what he looked like, but he must have been beautiful because he was amazing to her. And his voice was, Has God said to you, and then he immediately, without using the word liar, begins to make God look like a liar. He lied to you. It's not true. He knows that if you touch that tree and eat that tree, you're going to be just like him. That's the craziest thing to tell anybody that was created in the image and the likeness of God. They were created to be just like him. And now that you're created to be just like him, you're being deceived to think that he didn't want you to have that. He wants to keep it from you. But here's the neat thing. Is she saw, she saw that that tree was, was good to make one wise. And if you study what it says in the third chapter of Genesis, it, it's the same thing he talks about over in 1 John. And he talks about all this in the world is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Well, what was the tree in the garden? It was desired to make one wise. It was pleasant to be seen. It's the same spirit, same thing. So we walk into this earth to where we can walk spiritually or we can walk carnally. Spiritually is foolish to a carnal mind. If you're carnal-minded, man's spiritual things are like dumb. They're ignorant. You take a carnal-minded person and talk to them about why you give a tenth of your income into the gospel and to however you do that, that doesn't make sense to them. That is foolish to them. But if they could see how your life is increased... That would blow their mind. They'd think somehow something else is happening and you're fooling everybody. Oh, it does. It works. I love it. I play around with stuff outside just regular giving. I take $100 a week and out of that $100 a week, that's what I can do anything I want with. Anything. Pay a bill if I want to and I enjoy it. Since, since my wife and I got an agreement about me doing that, I'm telling you, just the other day for an example, I, I've been giving the money away, so I'm getting a little low. And all of a sudden, some more money came in. And then I had about 300 bucks in cash on me. And so I was, looking, I was looking at a pressure washer 
and I was looking at a generator. So I went out to Harbor Freight, their own sale, and I'm like, oh, man, I could buy this whole place if I had the money. I was eating it up. That's the place for a little man to go. And so I'm all into it, and then the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, just buy that generator and give it to so-and-so. And I thought, wow. Well, I had just had a serious physical accident in the gym. I had a hernia. And so I couldn't touch anything at the moment. I was speaking the word over my body. I'm healed by the stripes. And I wanted to grab that generator. And so I just went to the person and I just give them the money. And I said, here. I said, Lord, won't you have that generator over there? But you're going to have to go get it. I said, I'd love to have brought it to you. It's not going to happen. And, oh, they just went nuts. I was so tickled. I love stuff like that. So I give them the money. I really had a brother had taken the generator to him. So I went on about my business. Two days later, I come home, and I'm standing there looking out the back patio door, and there's a brand new pressure washer, which that's what I wanted more than the generator. And it's sitting on the back porch, and I'm like, wow, man, I'm all jacked up, you know. And so, because my other one, I let everybody use it, and they burn it up. And so I was waiting until I get around to buy another and let everybody use. And, and, and then here comes that one. Well, I'm very excited because I had sowed seed, not really thinking about that, but I knew I wanted to get it. And then I did that, and boom. So the next day I see the guy I gave the money to. I said, let me tell you what happened to me. You know, I gave you that money, and I done this and done that. Saw that pressure washer went nuts, and he just busted out laughing. He said, so you wanted a generator too, huh? I said, well, I kind of needed the pressure washer the most, and I said, God knew that. So he got me the pressure washer so I wouldn't be foolish and get a generator that I don't need nowhere like I do a pressure washer. And he said, I know, and the generator I bought is not exactly the one I give him the money for. Not exactly what I'd like to have. I found another one at another place that's got this big thing hooks up to the camper. I want that one. And the Lord told me to just give you my generator. I said, the one that I just bought for you. He said, yeah, I'm going to just give you that one because I want to go get that other one. And, and now I got a generator. And I, see, my point is this. A carnal mind would go, that's foolish. You giving that money to him. How stupid. But a spiritual mind goes, did you notice how my stupidity increased? <laughs> Hello. I mean, it's just multiplying. That's just a little example. Now, there's plenty of us in here that if you want something like that, that's not a thing to you. You could go out, you flip money, and you get it and go home. Now. But somewhere you need to find what will stretch you and what will stretch your faith. For some people, it's only 50 bucks, 100 bucks, two or 300. For some people, it's a few thousand. For Donald Trump, probably take at least four or 500 dollars. You know, But somebody's got to get stretched somewhere. And that's what's so wonderful about the things of God. Sweet water, bitter water should not come out of the same fountain. I say we speak sweet water only. Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 29, don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth, only that which is good for the use of edifying, that it might minister grace to the hearer. Y'all are quiet. See if this sounds familiar to you. I'm all about that grace, about that grace. No devil. Doesn't sound familiar to you. That's good then. You're not too carnal. Anyway, I'm all about that grace. No devil. What does that mean? Does I'm saying there is no devil? No, I'm saying I give grace all of the attention and none to the devil. He's defeated. He has nothing to do with me. He has no power over me. He can't read my mind. He's not as strong as I am. A little itty-bitty baby believer in Jesus Christ is a billion times stronger than any devil. And when you find out that you've got divine authority over everything, including the creep that creeps on the earth, as the Word teaches, you're going to get excited because the devil's a liar. I watched that video with that little kid standing out there screaming at that baby's door praying for his healing. Twelve years old, God spoke to him. All I could think about was the little ten-year-old boy sitting up here at Piedmont. This is about 33 years ago. 
Randy Shesto's here praying for people with cancer that are getting healed. They hear about it. They call us. Said this little boy's got a brain tumor. He's cut open. And so we go running up there to pray for him. Don't know the family. Never seen the kid. We get there and go in the room. It's just the kid. Nobody's there. He's sitting on the bed with his legs folded like a genie. That's where he was sitting. Had a cut right here. It went all the way down to the back of his neck. And it was stapled. Great big staples. His head was stapled together. Cutest little smile on that 10-year-old boy. Not a stitch of hair, nowhere, no eyebrows. We walked in, and he's smiling. I said, I'm Larry Souls, and this is Randy Shesto. I said, we come up here to pray for you. He said, I know it. He said, the Spirit of God spoke to me a while ago and said, two men are going to come in here and lay hands on you. And he said, God said he's going to heal me, and I'm going into the ministry. I looked over at Randy. I said, you hear that boy? And he said, well, let's do it. I thought, check this kid out, telling me to do it. So we just laid hands on him. We prayed for him. 14, 15 years later, I'm in a parade coming down Cherry Road with our church. Got banners, praise and worship, a big float. It's awesome, people loving it. This big giant man runs out, picks me up, slings me everywhere. Whew. said, this is the best friend I ever had in my life. And I said, man, I am so sorry, but I don't even know you. He said, you don't remember me? I said, I ain't never seen you. And he began to tell me, I said, you're the little boy that Randy and I, he wanted to know where Randy was. And I told him a little bit about Randy. We're marching down the street. The parade is moving. We're talking about all this stuff going on. And he's got, he, and I said, well, what are you doing now? He said, I'm an evangelist for the Nazarene denomination, and I've been overseas in the other countries preaching the gospel. And he's all fired up, so he's done evangelism work. Now he's pastoring a church in the United States. Come by here last year, dropped his card off, and said, just wanted y'all, I wasn't here, let the pastor know that I'm going to be preaching at a Nazarene church in Rock Hill. Well, I didn't even come to this church that Sunday morning. I walked in here. Well, I did come here, and I found out that happened, and I saw that card, and I left. And my son and I went to that Nazarene church, went there and sit down and listened to his testimony and listened to him preach. My goodness. And here he is now, almost 50 years old, or, or what, late 40s or something, and he has a family and children, and he's preaching, and he's an evangelist. And it ought just to stop and think about a little boy, 10 years old, so full of faith, he's just waiting for somebody to come in and be obedient to God because he had done heard a word and it says two men will come in and pray for you. I'll heal you and I'll put you in the ministry. Well, when we walked in that door, no wonder he was grinning. His faith was so illuminated, he didn't see Larry and Randy. He looked and he saw, whoo, my healing and my ministry. Here they come. I was healing, Randy was ministry. We, we went walking in there, man, and it was on. The power of God come down. And to this day, because we went to visit someone we did not know, there's a great ministry going on. Lives are being touched. People being saved overseas. A family got a great daddy that would have never had if it hadn't been for the power of God to touch a little kid. Don't you love it? Let me tell you something about the faith of a child. It's awesome because they don't compromise. And James said sweet and bitter water. Then, see, when I got there, that boy didn't have nothing but sweet water. God said sweet water. God said sweet water. You know how you can always tell God told you something? You always know what the devil had to say about it. But the problem is most people put more attention on that. And God tells you to do something and the devil tells you you can't. And the people will say, well, we wanted to do that, but it's too big. We just can't. It's just too much. Man, you got to believe God where you are. You might not believe this one. I worked at Duke Power. And we're getting ready to go into the ministry. My pastor, my home church is in Gaffney. They want us to start in Rock Hill. My pastor said, you just start doing the Sunday night and Wednesday night services and keep coming here on Sunday morning. So we kept doing that for a while. And, and we were still coming out of debt. Things were happening. And our lives were being straightened out. And all of a sudden, things are being cleaned up. And now it's time to start a Sunday morning service. And we're like, we don't have any money. I'm serious. I made good money at Duke Power. And I tithed and I paid my bills. But I did not have the extra money to go out and buy church stuff. It was our first Sunday. And we're going to be at Denny's, Howard Johnson's, Cherry Road, Exit 82. The Shield of Faith World Outreach Center. So here we go. And Kathy says... What are we going to do about getting rooms there? I said, I'm just trusting God. 
Well, where are you going to get the money? I'm just trusting God. I know he wants me to do this. I'm just believing God. So I went out there, and I got the room, set it up, and I said, can I pay when I finish? And they said, yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm just believing God for the money. So we had the service. Do you know how much that room cost back then? Man, that was $25. Where am I going to get that? So anyway, y'all looking at me real funny. I'm serious. $25 I was believing for. Signed the room up, had our first service, and here come three senior citizens in their 60s, if I can say that. Bill Childers, Reba Childers, his wife, and his sister, Mama Lil, who is 95 now. She was 60 when she came to church here. And they came in, and they sat down, and went, my first three members of our church, there they are. I'd known them. It was our first service, and here they come. And so we had church, did not receive tithes, did not, not that I remember, nor anything. I just know I needed $25 to pay for this room. And so church was over, dismissed. We hugged all seven of us, and we had a great revival. That was me, my wife, my two children at that time, and the other three. <laughs> Boy, we had church that day. So when we're walking out, he looks at me and he says, Bill says, Pastor, I'm going to just tell you right now, I believe something's getting ready to happen. How much is this room? I said, it's $25. And he probably thought I'd paid for it. He said, well, here, I want to pay for it. Here's $25. And you're going to need another room next week. I just got a feeling. So here's 50. Let's get two rooms. I said, what's the other room for? I said, got to have a nursery. And so the next, the next Sunday when we came, I don't know where in the world them people come from. But there they come, fill that little room up. And sure enough, we, we had to get a volunteer to go sit in the other room with a bunch of babies. You're talking about children's ministry. Whew, Star Stroud. So she goes over there. That was our first children worker. But we're just believing God. And we begin just with believe God for the $25. And then we just kept believing. And we're how we're job. Then we believed God to get a room for $100 a week. It was at Shepherd's Fold Bookstore. And we went there. And we were there for a few months. Then we found a beer joint on Anna Frail Street with a big giant Paps Blue Ribbon sign. And it talked about this place is for you on the front of it. And I thought, yes, it is. And the Lord, as I rode by it, told me, he said, go inquire. I said, oh, man. And, of course, it was leaning a little bit, and uh, I thought we might could straighten it up. So I went home, Kathy, Kathy, Kathy. The Lord spoke to me. I rode by a building. He said, go inquire about it. She got so excited. And so I went and inquired about it and found out it was for sale, and they didn't want but $46,000 for it, and it had two buildings on it. Oh, we can start revival for the world there. And I was so excited. I went and got my wife, said, let me show it to you. Drove her to it. We pulled up in front of it, and there it was leaning a little bit. I guess it was about 80 or 90 years old. And it was an old beer joint, and one side was a hair salon. And I think it was birthed in about 1938. Seriously. And so she looked at that, and she said, there is no way. When we walked into the building... There were great big giant pictures of dogs playing cards and shooting pool. It, all kinds of real cool stuff. And, and, I mean, all kinds of stuff was in there. It was a bona fide beer joint. I should have kept them pictures. Anyway, we cleaned that place up. And just believe, I believe in God and praying, Lord, I need the money. So I went and dickered with the guy. And I said, how much you want now? And he said, 46, wouldn't budge and uh, wouldn't do anything. And I said, man, he said, I tell you what, if you'll give me $5,000, I'll just finance the rest of it for you for 6%. I said, $5,000? That was $500 million to me. And, buddy, I went back to the church, and it was one of our very f first few Sunday mornings uh, of doing Sundays, and I told him I had found a building. I got to get $5,000 to get a deposit on it. And I said, we're going to believe God. And uh, so we received an offering and if I'm not mistaken, it was like 2000 I can't remember exactly. It was close to $3,000. And we did it all day. Well, this little teeny grandma, itty-bitty tiny woman walks up to me 
and said, the Lord told me to give you this, and she stuck it in my pocket. Well, that was early that morning before I said anything. I thought it was just, you know, $10. That happens sometimes. and You hate to take it, but you hate to turn it down because you know they're sowing seed, you know? So it was just in my pocket. I preached with it in my pocket. I received that offering with it in my pocket. Then Sunday night, it was in my pocket. And I'm driving out of the parking lot thinking, gosh, we're short. We're not going to get it. i got to have that money by tomorrow. He's selling it to another guy. You know, I'm going, wow. I heard somebody scream. I stopped and I went in. I said, what's going on? What y'all screaming about? Oh, I didn't tell you this. As I was walking out, I remembered I had that check and I thought, well, I already, I'll just give it to the church. I said, here, just put that in the offering. That's why they were screaming. It was a check for $2,000 and we had raised $3,000 no, I don't know. I, we've done so many offerings. I got that messed up. We were raising five and none came in. I had the $5,000 check in my pocket. We tried to receive the offering for it that morning. And it, I've got that one confused with another offering. Nothing happened. And when I was leaving, they were screaming. And I come back in, what? That check you just gave us from Grandma? I said, yeah. Man, that's $5,000 you got to understand, we got a congregation of like 30. Hello? And, oh yeah, and that $5,000 met that guy the next morning, slammed that baby down, and he looked at me, and I said, Woo-hoo, you said if I got here with it first. And he kept his word. We got the building, and that was great. We were there a few years. Then we went over to the bingo building for a few years. Then we bought this 50-something acres. It's all paid for over $4 million. And glory be to God, we're getting ready to grow and blow. We're getting ready to reap the harvest, hallelujah, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And before I quit, I need a few more minutes to tell you what I got to tell you this morning so we can reap the harvest correctly. Can I get an amen? Are y'all ready to plow? Are you ready to plant? Are you ready to reap? Well, you can't do it by yourself. You're going to need some help. In Deuteronomy, would you pull up Deuteronomy for me, please? Hallelujah. You're going to love this. Deb, you're not mad at me, are you? Now watch this. Deuteronomy 22.9. You shall not sow your vineyard with different seeds. Least the fruit of your seed that you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard. It'll be defiled. It means it will be forfeited. It means null. Abrogate. It means nullify. Doesn't matter. You mixed your seed, you'll kill your harvest. That's why we teach so strong around here what the Bible teaches about you become who you hang with. And since you become who you hang with, your decisions and your choices of who your friends are totally determine your prosperity, your attitude, where you are, what you're like. Just think, the very people that you know and associate with, you can't blame them because they didn't make you act like them, but they're influencing you. I'm telling you the truth. Influence is everything. I got born again, and this guy I partied with all the time, did everything with. We were both married and we both partying. I got born again, and I mean, buddy, he shows up at the house with a big old bag of pot and a six-pack of slits. I thought he, he definitely something wrong with him about drink slits. You know right there there's something wrong with him. And so here he comes <laughs> with his slits. He's standing on the front porch. I said, man, I said, I just gave my heart to Christ last week. I said, uh, if you don't mind, go put that back in your car. Don't bring it in my house. He said, man, we just got the house. We just moved in. It got saved and moved. He said, man, I come over here to break your house in. We're going to celebrate. And, man, he pulls out a big bunch of pot and beer. He's got, and everything's free. It's funny. When you love and you serve God, everything and sin's free and plenty. When, when you're out there raising hell trying to do it, you just can't hardly find nobody. You chase women and can't catch them. Hello. You just, it don't work. But you try to live right. Hello. Where was I anyway? <laughs> that got me tickled. Hallelujah. So the bottom line is, if you mix your seed with something else, it won't work. That's why faith has to stay by itself. You can't have another plan. 
You can't have another idea in case it doesn't work. If you have a plan B, faith is not in there. Nothing wrong with plan A, plan B. But if you want to talk about faith, plan A and B has nothing to do with faith. That's your own business. You thought about it. You've organized it. Put your ability in it. And God bless you. Hope things work out. But when you're going to believe God, you can't add a bunch of stuff to it. That's why God and Abraham did so well. It says that God and Abraham both called things that were not as though they were. What was that? Well, God told Abraham that his son would be the king of a nation. Then he told him to take him up and to sacrifice him. The Bible says Abraham had a vision that God raised his son up from the ashes of that sacrifice simply because it's impossible that God could lie. And if God had promised that Isaac was going to be the king of a nation, then even if he slits his throat and burns him to ashes, he's got to raise from the dead or the creator of all things is a liar. That's what Abraham thought. That sounds mean and rough, I know. But that's what he thought. And he was to the point that he would say, there's no way my God can lie. So he gets his kid and he goes to the end of the mountain. And what does the scripture say? It says he turned to his servants and handed them the leashes of the mules. And what did he tell them? He said, you hang on to my stuff, boys. Me and my boy, we'll be right back. Wait a minute. You're going to give him as a sacrifice and you're telling everybody you're coming back? And so he gives it to him, and he goes up, and when he pulls that knife back, this is where preachers like, oh, how hard it must have been for old Abraham. Are you kidding? Abraham was chomping at the bit to get up that mountain, throw that boy on that altar. Abraham was ready to prove that God is God, that God cannot lie. This is the first Jew, by the way. First this is the covenant-making man. This is the man that God's going to use to establish ties. You ever hear people, well, tithing's under the Old Testament, so it's under the law. <laughs> tithing was way before the law. 430 years before the law, they was tithed. Why? Because our father of faith, Abraham, taught us how to trust God, release His power, release His anointing by the acts and the things of God that we do. When we operate in the knowledge of God, we get the blessings of God. When we operate in the knowledge of carnality, you get it. If you're carnal, it brings death. If you're spiritual, it brings life. Carnality is always opposed to things that are spiritual. Always. All my life I've heard comedians that are atheists make jokes and laugh and go on. George Garland, he knows the truth now. It's too bad he can't come back and tell you. Hello? Y'all quiet in here. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm here to tell you, man, that you are the greatest creation in all the universe and Satan would like to sow another seed in it so that it won't get its full harvest. If you mix another seed with what God's doing, you will flop. You can't hold your Bible, read and pray and believe Him and at the same time hang out at nightclubs and sleep with people and do things that's wrong. It doesn't work. Man, the seed has got to be singular. It's got to be that seed of God and it will grow in itself. It will multiply it will reproduce but you sow one little perverted seed in it and it'll kill it faith is like a grain of mustard seed a mustard seed is the only seed so we labor on the size don't we it's the only seed that listen if you crossbreed it with anything nothing you get nothing faith is like a grain of mustard seed you can't plant anything with it. It's got to stay by itself. And it's going to be the littlest and the smallest of all the seeds that exist. And it still needs no help. Do not assist it with any other seeds. And it will grow and be greater and mightier than all the big seeds can produce. That's the way faith in God is. It's not complicated. It's a great thing. But what will help you have faith in God is who you walk with. And I'll close out giving you some scripture. Deuteronomy 22.9. Now let's jump over to 10. Come on, Deb, help me out. You shall not plow with an ox and an ass together. If you've been here any time, you've heard me preach a message entitled that. And I'm going to tell you something. If animals could talk, 
these two boys right here would have a lot to say because I want to tell you what the words mean. Oxen in the Bible, it means strength and praise. That's what it means. Ox. Did you know that an ox nature is to plow straight? Did you know his nature is to plow? You don't even have to hardly teach him. I mean, you just direct them and they pick it up quick because they're born to do it. They love it. When you yoke them up, they like to take that 12 to 1400 pound body and they just lean forward. It drags that plow like it's nothing. And people are poor ox out there working so hard. And so, that ox isn't working half as hard as you. He knows how to let his weight pull it instead of all of his muscles. And he gets a little rhythm down. And them oxen, they just let the weight do it. They're just walking through the forest. I'm serious. And that's what they do. They plow straight. Why is that important to a farmer? Because a straight row produces life. And a crooked row kills the crop because it holds too much moisture and water. And so when you're farming, you got to plow straight because every crooked place is a potential for your seed to die. And then he says this. Now don't go and plow your ox with an ass. The word ass, or you prefer, for those of you freaking out in the year 2015, donkey. The word donkey means stupid. Can somebody say stupid? I learned a very valuable lesson watching Forrest Gump. Stupid is, stupid does. Do not yoke yourself up with stupid. How's that for good preaching? Now, when you put an ox and an ass together and you really think that you're going to go produce a great harvest for your family. The whole community's coming to your farmer's market, aren't they? Because after all, you hooked the ass up to your ox to help him out. You wanted a little more pull. Well, that word stupid and stubborn, which is the word ass, that's what it means. Yoke goes around the neck. What is the neck symbolic of? Your will. If you don't think it, wait till somebody grabs it and gets a good choke on it. Your will's very, very there. So, your yoke is around the neck. That's where you submit, around the neck. That's why you tie the word, bind the word to your neck, to your will, to your fingers, what you do, okay? On your forehead, for what you think. Doesn't the Bible say that in the day that Christ comes back, all the saints will be found with His Name written in their foreheads. It'll be seven, seven, seven. I wonder if that's a computer chip. Go figure that one out. How about no? It's a renewed mind in Christ Jesus. Six, six, six. Ah, the tattoo in the computer chip. No. Humanism, humanism, and humanism. Are you listening to me? Boy, you guys are funny out there. See, People are being taught so many things that brings in mystical and curiosity and, and the body of Christ has no business in chasing that junk. We are the most stable, solid of all that is in the earth. We have the Word of God and the Creator to back it up. I don't need to freak out. Are y'all okay? I'm telling you, the earth will never be destroyed. Just read Ecclesiastes 1 and 2. Go read Psalm 119, which is long. But it'll tell you over and over and over and over and over. That the earth is forever, the earth is forever, the earth is forever. Yes, Pastor, but I was reading in the Old Testament, it says, and then will the end come of the world. Yeah, the world's coming to an end, but not the earth. The word world means cosmos, order, and arrangement of time. In other words, the day the New Testament began, the sun come up the same, people went to work the same, everything was the same, but guess what? It was a new era. The old world passed away and a new world begun. The world of law has ceased and the world of grace has begun. People were alive when that happened. They were still doing what they do and it manifested from law into grace. 
and you're going to be living and we're walking in this earth and we are the kingdom of God in the earth. It's not over here or over yonder. The kingdom of God is invisible. No eye has ever seen the kingdom of God. Jesus said with his own mouth. No man has ever seen it. He said as a matter of fact, when it comes, it'll come with no observation. He said when it comes, you won't even see it. But if you stop and think about it, all the message is about what it's going to look like. Well, it's the truth. Luke 17, 21, Behold the kingdom, king, ruler, dumb, dominion, means where? The king rules in here. Okay, the kingdom rules within you. Are y'all okay today? The reason we don't plow an ass and an ox together is because it stops the harvest of the gospel. We got to get bold, and when we hook up, if anybody going to plow with you, they need to think like you're thinking. They need, you need to know they're willing to take their weight and pull straight. That they're not going to, when you say something to somebody like, I, I heard that you went with that woman. Yeah, but my wife doesn't really satisfy me and meet my needs, but that woman, now she's good to me. Nobody knows nothing about it, but she's a good woman, and she's this, and she helps me. And the next thing you know, you got a fella having you think that committing adultery is no big thing. And you hang with somebody that lives like that. There's nothing wrong with knowing them, helping them, praying for them, strengthening them, encouraging them, giving them some good word, and just loving on them. Don't condemn them. But to hang, to go yoke yourself up with people that you know, that you know, that you know they're going against the will of God? No way, baby. I don't want that. I got two minutes left, so hold on. I've never been to a church in my life you get out this early, but mine, or y'all's or ours. Y'all get to say mine. Every time I do, I always have some sarc. It ain't your church. Now, ain't that something? It's yours, and I can't have it. And y'all wouldn't believe the stuff I hear. You know, I won't even go there. Hallelujah. Because I ain't got time to tell you about all them donkeys that's been talking to me. Man, let me tell you about the oxen. Are y'all okay today? And he's just making it simple. Don't you plow your ox. Don't take your praise and your strength to God. And don't go over here and hang around with stubborn and stupid. Because if you mix it, you got sweet and bitter water come out. One drop of gas and a gallon of pure water. is What is that gallon of pure water now? It's just corrupt. And it didn't take much to corrupt a whole gallon. Now, if I put one drop of gas in any gallon of water and shake it up, you know you don't want to drink it. And the body of Christ will find themselves going to church and they will fill up with the oxen and they'll go somewhere and play with the ass. It's the truth. And you wonder why you don't have all the strength. You know, I went to church. It was good, man. It was powerful. Everybody was singing and praying. I couldn't wait. And then I got up Monday morning on the job, and everybody was cussing and fussing and mad. And it's another gloomy Monday. And I was like, where'd everybody go? It was great yesterday. It's in here. It's not out there. I've had experiences with God on construction sites that I promise now, I'm serious, that when it is storming, Physically stormy, real true rain coming down. Gray, thick, almost black, storm. 4,900 workers around me. And I promise you, I didn't even know it until somebody told me. I thought the sun was shining. It was beautiful. It was dry to me. I've had experiences with God that only I can believe it. I'm telling you. And I remember walking out at the, at the end of the day with a group of people, talking about how beautiful the day's been. They all started cussing and fussing, pitching a fit, telling me how bad it's been. How it's rain. And I said, it rained? And they said, rained? It's monsooned! And they were... I've honestly had those experiences. Are y'all okay? I've had experiences that... And the reason some of you have had them, and even though you might not ever be able to explain it or nobody believe it, it's for you. And it's when stuff starts happening in your life and you want to know where God is, He will remind you. David got in that cave and started meditating on the times and places God delivered him and pulled him out. 
And it gave him strength. And he come out of that cave thinking, if God delivered me from that lion and that bear, oh, let's just go get it on. See, but if you hang around the wrong people, they'll let you know, man, you shouldn't be thinking like that. You are not to talk like that. People will think you're crazy. They'll think you're a fool. I am. We all, we all are. Everybody's a fool of some sort. I can prove it too. I don't have time. But at least I know whose fool I am. I'm a fool for Christ. I'm not a fool for humanism. I'm not a fool for all of the things that brings corruption. I'm a fool for the anointing. The word Christ means the power of God. I'm a fool for the power of God. I love it. I'm crazy about it. I love to lay hands on people and just watch God do something crazy. Isn't it awesome? Don't you just love it? Oh, man. Oh, God is so good. The Spirit of the Lord is rising up in the hearts of some of you and you're beginning to see the power of His Word. That in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was manifested and made flesh among us. And it was Christ Jesus, the Word made flesh. And His name was what? Emmanuel. What does His name mean? It means that God is with us. Who? Not somebody else. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He's called the Son of Man because He was born from the womb of a woman. He's called the Son of God because God's His daddy. But He's also called Emmanuel because He is God incarnate. In other words, Jesus Christ, He is God Himself in the flesh. And He Himself, God, has taken on the likeness of sinful flesh and without ever committing sin, walked in the earth with no sin, with no guile coming out of his mouth and yet in that body of flesh was able to release and show man how he intended him to live why he created him what he's to be like and Jesus Christ is a perfect example of the very first Adam and he is the last Adam and in him Adam is dead and in Christ we all live but if you go fellowship with Adam that tree of the knowledge of good and evil if you go mess with Adam the ass the donkey the rebellion the stupid you'll get his benefits but if you go to the last Adam Jesus Christ who wiped out the Adamic nature and that praise God we're partakers of a divine nature by him I'm the head not the tail above only and never beneath see the way I'm talking now carnal people oh that man's crazy Oh, you should have been with me when I was crazy. I'm going to tell you something, man. The power of God works. The anointing is strong and powerful. It just, it's above and beyond what you could ask or think. I love walking on a construction job and all these bad iron workers mad and fussing and cussing. And the power of God showed right up in the middle of it. I loved it. Old Roy Brewington standing by the crane. He said, I'm scared I'm going to die every day. I wake up. I'm afraid to come to this job. I said, Roy, you're a big man. You're strong. What are you afraid of? I don't know. I can't figure it out. But for the past two months, I'm scared I'm going to die. And I'm scared. And while he was just freaking out like that, I was looking at him. The Spirit of God hit me and said, just slap him on the head. And I did. I said, in the name of Jesus, like that. And he said, pow, he flew back and he hit the dirt. And his hard hat flew off. And it wasn't a second. Two iron workers had me, slammed me up against the crane. I hadn't had his fist back. And I'm watching that fist coming. And they said, who do you think you are hitting him? It was all, I said, I didn't hit him. Yeah, you did. We seen it. I said, no, I didn't. Boy, thank God. Roy got up. Hey, don't bother him. Woo. He was speaking in tongues. He's a Baptist. He got up and he was speaking in tongues. That boy got so fired up with God, he went and bought a tent, quit work, and went into an evangelist work. Amen. Is that not crazy? He just walked into a construction site one day, I'm scared I'm going to die, I'm scared I'm going to die. Scared. Bam, hits the dirt. Gets up, I'm not afraid of death. And the next day, give me a tent, I'm going to preach. I mean, good gracious. God, wait a minute, you need to learn to read the Bible first. I mean, he was ready to go. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Woo, glory to God. God doesn't need many mighty or noble. Hello, not many of them are called. 
But buddy, the people he calls when he gets through with you, you'll be mighty and noble. You know why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you ever get a hint of how much he loves you. Oh, there's so many religions and denominations. If we could just trim it all down and say, listen, he made you for him. You was made for him. And he loves you so much. And if you'll just go to him with his word, believe his word and speak his word, he will manifest himself to you. And you'll see signs and wonders and miracles. I get tickled. I had a hernia. It's funny. I flow in miracles and when something happens to me, people act shocked. It's hilarious. (gasps) Pastor had a hernia? Wonder what kind of sin he was in. He must have said or done something. Nothing would have happened to him, you know. That's just the way people talk. You go through a hard time, wonder what his sin was. How about not looking where I was going? Are y'all okay? People so funny. I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have to commit a sin for something to happen. Can I get an amen? You can exercise, live right, and do everything. When they get a bad report, hey, where'd that come from? But when that happens, because you're in the Word, you know what to do. I don't say it when it happens. I've been saying it. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Soon as, and listen, when I went and got that baby checked, everything happens for some kind of reason. I went to VA. I waited from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. They put me in the CAT scan and said, it took that long. That was an emergency. And they, said, and, they, and they said, where's your IV? I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, you've got to have an IV. I said, I don't know. They said, well, get out. I said, get out. And they said, yeah, you have to come back next week. I said, man, you got to be kidding me. And so... They sent me home to come back at another time because somebody didn't put an IV. I don't why it matters because every time they've ever done it, they've never put nothing in it. I promise. I'll never, ever forget my very... Oh, y'all don't even want to hear this story. No, you don't want to hear my first... Blah, Anyway, I remember when it was all over, I said, what was this for? And they just said, as for your anesthesia. I said, why didn't they put some in it? They said... They didn't nobody give you nothing. I said, why do you think my fingerprints is on that steel pole? <laughs> oh, yeah, y'all laughing. I didn't know they put people to sleep to do that. Yeah, your pastor knows every turn, every curve. Anyway, but <laughs> well, you might be laughing. But it wasn't funny. <clears throat> it wasn't funny. And it still ain't funny. <laughs> Woo. But anyway, I forgot what I was telling you. I ain't going to worry about it. The clock said I got to quit, so it wouldn't matter if I remembered. Would you all stand up on your feet with me? Oh, praise God, Jesus is Lord. I want you to stop as I get ready to let you go down to Rosie's Kitchen and get some of that good food. That's some good soul food down there. Great day, them mamas can cook. Mm. How many of you know that's right? I know it. High fat, high cholesterol diet. But stop for just a moment and ask yourself, and don't tell anybody, ask yourself. Have I been yoking others in my life that are not helping me plow straight? Is what I'm supposed to be doing for my wife, my husband, my children, my life? If certain people in my life didn't have reins on me, what would it be like? Now, I know this could get touchy because it's like, oh, you think you're better than others. No, listen, that has nothing to do with it, no matter what I thought. Scripturally, we need to hang with what you want to become. I want to become strong in God, knowledgeable in God. I enjoy walking in the earth with signs and wonders. That's what I was telling you, me having a problem. The funny thing about me, do you know how the word of knowledge moves through me in miracles? Now, I don't hardly ever hear this. I met one person that told me the same thing happens to them. When you hear me say things, there's pain here, there's pain there. If you have that, come out and let me pray for you. It's happening to me. And as it's happening, I feel it. And I've actually had it so bad that I've jerked and bucked from the pain. I mean, it hit me and I just, "Mm," while I'm calling it out. And it will not leave my body till I pray for that person. Now, I'm not saying that's the way it is for everybody. But when I started moving in the gifts, most people get the word of knowledge, they hear it, and they speak it. Now, that happens too. But a lot of times, my physical body will act up to whatever's going on around me, and I'll just know. And that's how I'll speak it out. And I've had folks look at me and say, how did you know I was hurting there? And I'd say, oh, believe me, I know. 
And I lay hands on them and pray for them, and the pain leaves me. And when it leaves me, I go, you're healed. And I mean, man, have we seen some miracles, or have we seen some miracles? Seriously. Some serious miracles. Well, I got stuff I would like to just keep telling you, but I can tell the Baptist in you is hungry. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this people. I just grace them with your word. I pray that this small segment of time will have something to do with the rudder of their ship being changed, that their lives stay on course. Father, we thank you that you love us so much and that you've already forgiven us. I just pray the eyes of our understanding be enlightened that we'll wake up and receive it, acknowledge it, and let you be God and Lord and Father in our lives. And now, sir, we're all going to say a confession to you, and we thank you that by faith you hear it and you bless it in Jesus' name. I want everybody to say this prayer with me. Say, oh God, I thank you right now for the power of the blood of Jesus. I repent of all my sin, thoughts that are wrong, and I ask you to forgive me. And I receive that forgiveness in Jesus' name. And from this day forward, I'll never be the same. You will not leave me. You will not forsake me. And you will always lead and guide me. In Jesus' name, I trust you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Woo! Now, if you meant that, turn around and tell somebody you meant it. And if you tell somebody you meant it, it's an anchored thing. Glory to God. Well, I love you guys. If you need prayer for anything after I dismiss, we'll hang down here and be glad to pray for you. We love you. Now, hug somebody. Tell them to do the Word. And you go do the Word. God bless you.